Hello everyone and welcome to the second meeting of the Community of Practice for Lewy Body Dementia. This recording is available on the Lewy Body Society YouTube channel and will be available in due course on, on the Community of Practice Professionals area on the Lewy Body website. Following the launch event on 5th of July 2023, we asked participants to choose topics they would like to explore in more detail at future events. These included hallucinations and delusions, sleep disturbance, movement and mobility difficulties, cognitive fluctuations, speech and communication, and more. We plan to address these in turn with hallucinations and delusions in Lewy body dementia as the first topic today. The core team members of the community of practice who are here today are myself, Angela Penny, a speech and language therapist, Rachel Thompson, Consultant Admiral Nurse for Lewy Body Dementia. Rachel Webb, Lewy Body Admiral Nurse. Alison Killen, a health psychologist in a Lewy Body Dementia Clinic and a research associate in dementia. This is the agenda for today. Now I'll hand over to Rachel Thompson for a reminder of core symptoms of Lewy body dementia and an overview of hallucinations and delusions in Lewy body dementia. So thank you, Angela, and welcome everybody. We're delighted you could uh, spend some time watching this recording. Um, so today I'm gonna do a very quick whistle stop tour of the core symptoms of Lewy body dementia, but mostly we're gonna be focusing on hallucinations and delusions. So one of the more complex symptoms so Lewy body dementia, the most common disease you've never heard of. This is a phrase that's coined by the Lewy body society because we recognize that still a lot of people get a lot. It's a long time to get a diagnosis, but also really struggle to get an accurate diagnosis. In fact, it's actually quite a common cause of uh, dementia and it's the second most common cause of neurodegenerative dementia is accounting for about 10 to 15 percent. Now, that means there's about 125,000 people with Lewy body dementia in the UK. And this term Lewy body dementia, we're using it here to include both dementia with Lewy bodies, but also Parkinson's disease dementia with Lewy body dementia being the umbrella term. And I'll come on to talk about that in a bit more detail soon. But just to acknowledge that dementia and Parkinson's disease, it's about 30 percent overall. So not everybody with Parkinson's will go on to develop uh, Parkinson's dementia. The longer you live with Parkinson's, the increased chance you have of developing it. So there's some of the figures there. So next slide. So Lewy body disease. So Lewy body disease is actually the underlying disease process that can lead to Parkinson's disease. And as I've mentioned, some people with Parkinson's can then go on to develop Parkinson's dementia. But it also is the if we can go back a minute, just Angela, sorry, it also can lead to dementia with Lewy bodies. So, and really it depends on where these Lewy bodies um, form within the brain, but just reinforcing that Lewy body dementia is the collective term. So yes, yeah, so the next slide. So the, the one year rule. So this is um, uh, a, a kind of a development that has clarified, had to clarify um, the difference between Parkinson's disease, dementia and dementia with Lewy bodies, with Parkinson's disease, dementia really being when dementia starts one year or more after a fairly well established Parkinson's disease, whereas dementia with uh, Lewy bodies is when the dementia occurs before or sometimes at the same time as Parkinson features um, all within one year of onset of motor symptoms. So next slide. So here's some of the criteria for dementia with Lewy bodies that were revised in 2017. Um, and you will see here at the top that what we're looking at is whether the dementia is significantly impacting on somebody's functioning. But compared to other dementias, that people with, with dementia with Lewy bodies often have more of a preserved memory. And the cognitive changes that we see are more kind of attentional and linked to visual spatial impairment. But essentially, they have this diagnosis of cognitive decline and dementia. Now, there are four core symptoms that we talk about, and these are the ones are labelled in blue. The fluctuations in level of consciousness, which can vary from minute to minute, hour to hour. We've got REM sleep behaviour disorder or dream enactment, where the limbs can move around in sleep and can be really quite disturbing. 
We've got Parkinsonism, where we have some of the kind of very common features of Parkinson's disease, tremor, rigidity, gait problems, and then visual hallucinations, which is what we're talking about today. There are some other what we call supportive features that are also quite common, although not everybody will have all of these. And you will see on the left hand side, there's autonomic dysfunction, which include drops in blood pressure, urinary dysfunction, constipation, slowness of the gut, um, excess uh, saliva, a whole host of uh, problems. And then on the right hand side, we've got other neuropsychiatric features, anxiety, depression, apathy, systemized illusions. Now, we are going to be talking about some of those in later sessions. Um, but today, as I said, our focus is on the visual hallucinations. Um, so next slide. So how is vision formed? So it's an active process, which is actually based on learning from previous experiences. So here we have a picture of a brick wall. If you can uh, click onto the next picture. Now, hopefully now what you can see very clearly is a cigar sticking out of the brick wall. So if you can click the next. And so now, because you've learned to see that, hopefully now you see this picture again, you can't kind of not see that cigar. It's very, very obvious. So this is just a kind of a, a little bit of a, an idea about how we form uh, our, our learning around vision. So next. So illusions and pareidolia. So if we're seeing vision as a kind of a spectrum, illusions and pareidolia. Now, these are quite common. So here we have a picture of a face. I'm going to see if you can see a face in the next picture. Picture of some clouds. Hopefully you can see that. And then the next picture, slightly harder, but there some people can see a face in that bit of wood. Now, here's an illustration that something that we all do, actually, is that we, we're looking, our brain is trying to make sense of things that we see. And actually, faces are very familiar. So this is one of the things that actually is quite normal. Um, so next slide. So when we're starting to talk about hallucinations and lewd body dementia, we think that actually, essentially, the brain wiring becomes faulty, but there's no one single brain region that's responsible. What the research is showing is there are changes in the brain that can lead to misinterpretation of the visual information that we see. And there's a number of different systems affected, the dopaminergic, acetylcholine and the serotonergic symptoms. But both the sensory input, the information that comes in via our eyes and the way that we interpret in th that information is affected. Again, some of the studies are showing that perhaps with people who have visual hallucinations, that they're showing there's white matter changes that can be found at the back of the brain, uh, probably to do with the occipital lobe, but also the thalamus, the midbrain can lose volume. Now, there are different types of hallucinations. We've got minor hallucinations. Um, now, hallucinations can occur in other modalities, such as auditory, the hearing and olfactory, smell. But there's also something called passage or passage hallucinations. And these are things that occur at the side of the vision. So that fleeting, people think they've seen something and they turn and they can't see it. Or presence hallucinations, when this is actually not, it, this is actually quite common where people just feel very distinct that there's somebody nearby. Um, so next slide. So in Lewy body, when we're talking about the core symptom, we're actually mostly talking about complex visual hallucinations. Now these can occur in perhaps up to 80% of people with Lewy body dementia. They're usually complex, they're usually well-formed, they're usually recurring. So people will often say they see the similar things, perhaps somebody they see somebody watching in the garden or they see somebody standing in the corner of the room or perhaps they see children in the house or animals indeed. They're more common in the evening and at night, perhaps exacerbated by the re reduction of lighting. Um, and they're often, you know, as I said, they're three-dimensional. Now, some of these actually can be quite actually quite familiar and not that upsetting, whereas others can be really quite distressing and quite disturbing for the person and for the people around them. Um, so next slide. So we're going to show you in a minute a very short clip um, about the experience of people with Lewy body dementia talking about what it feels like or their families talking about what it feels like to live with hallucinations. So hopefully this will work. Can I talk about my family, my pretend family? The children live with me. 
pretend little children. They didn't talk. I used to say, look, we could have such fun together. Why don't you talk to me? And I'd ask questions like, well, what do they wear? And then she said, that's a good question because I don't really know what they wear. And I'd find food around the house. And I treated them like proper children. And I gave them each a little biscuit at milk time. I mean, they really were there. I gave them pen and pencil to see if they could write or scribble or anything. But they were still exactly as I left it when I came back. I think we often forget the nature of the person, but what we're actually seeing is an amazing woman trying to care with all the love and attention on these children. This uh, family meant a lot to me. I believed it wholeheartedly. So hopefully that gives you a real insight um, into what it might feel like that um that video is available actually and uh the on on a website it's uh another presence um um if you just look that up you'll be able to find the whole thing so i'm going to mention talk very quickly about delusions in new body dementia because this is another you know not that uh uncommon symptom so delusion essentially is a false belief that's not based on reality. Now, it may be fixed for some people, but in Lewy body dementia, it can change and it can fluctuate. Um, there are different types of delusions that we recognise. Um, accusions of theft, for example, typically more common in Alzheimer's disease. Um, perhaps sometimes maybe linked to memory problems because people have forgotten where they've put things and kind of try to make sense of where's it gone. There's something called delusions of infidelity, called the Othello syndrome. There's also delusions of misidentification. This is what we tend to see more in Lewy body dementia. And there are different types. There's something called Capgra, Capgra or Capgras. Um, and that, that includes Frigoli syndrome, where people see the same face in perhaps in crowds and they feel like they're being followed. Or also clonal pluralization, where people see multiple copies of objects, places or people. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about Capgra, which is the next slide. Um, now, this is something that we see quite commonly. It's the illusion of misidentification. It may actually be linked to hallucinations because people may be thinking that actually their, their visual field has changed. So the fate, they're not recognising the face in quite the same way. And what we often see is people say that there's several versions of the, of the, of the same person. It's often a spouse or a very familiar person, which can be really challenging. And this person may be good or bad, um, but again, can cause real difficulties. And Rachel, where my colleague is going to talk a little bit more about how to manage that. So I'm going to hand over to Rachel now, um, who's going to talk you through a case study. Thank you, Rachel. Hello. Um, so we've added a, a quick case study in here. So I'll um, you can have a read through. So you can pause now if you want and have a read through. So this is just a bit about you having a reflection on what you do. And then on the next slide, uh, we've put some pointers just for you to have a think about. So again, you can pause here and flick backwards and forwards between these two. And obviously, if you're doing this as uh, you're watching it with a colleague or something, then you could get together and have a chat. So I'll now move on to looking at some hints and tips of how to manage things around, you know, similar to the case study or something like that. So when we talk about managing hallucinations, the overall general arching theme is is it's better not to disagree or challenge somebody. So when somebody's experiencing these hallucinations, they're very real to them. So although you can't see them, they will be real to that person. So trying to say to the person it's not true or it's not believable or you can't see it can be quite stressing because they feel not listened to. 
so we often say calmly try and encourage the person to talk about what they're seeing sometimes talking about it makes them disappear um, because they're interacting with it and then it doesn't stay real um, sometimes that can help calm them so if they're frightened or they're distressed about them you can say I, I know it's real for you but I can't I can't see it so let's have a chat about what you see sometimes when they talk about it it makes it less distressing because they they can then describe it and sometimes that hallucination turns into a person that's quite familiar to them and then they find it quite comforting we often talk about offering reassurance so yes let them know that you can't see the same but you understand that what they can see is real for them sometimes we talk about while you're having that conversation about them is checking out the reality of can they touch them sometimes it might be a person that's no longer alive so it might be about having that conversation and then they'll kind of go yeah I can't see that person because I know they're not here so I know it's my mind playing tricks on me sometimes you talk about trying to talk to that person see if they'll answer back sometimes it's about actually just offering another distraction so while you're having that conversation with them about things try and move it on to something else um, as you do it um, so it activates it sometimes we talk about uh, you know creating another sense so if they can if they're seeing something perhaps closing their eyes opening in it again or then focusing on touching something uh, giving them some to, to touch or drink can sometimes help again looking at changing lighting often especially uh, we're in winter at the moment so this time of year when you get dusk and shadows are dark they can rear shadows so sometimes it's about putting bright lights on before it actually gets dark so that they don't have that dusk experience sometimes it's moving to another room change of environment looking away if it's something outside opening closing the curtains things like that um next slide please so when we talk about as well it's these are kind of the general things to try and manage them so obviously check um eye tests and things like that that actually they're seeing properly so sometimes it may be an eyesight issue in combination with the Lewy body and obviously if we can do something to help them again looking at the environment so sometimes some people will particularly pick a particular area of the room so again it's about is there something about that is it the patterns on the curtains is it patterns on the carpets is it a rug over the back of the sofa is it a cushion on the sofa that's that's looking like things again you know going back to that lighting is it the lights that are creating shadows especially at night time you know do they see something on the landing that may need moving things like mirrors pictures obviously mirrors can uh, create reflections again glass can create reflections or sometimes people see things in pictures so going back to what rachel mentioned about you know those, those cloud images and things someone might have had a picture up for, for years and then all of a sudden it actually takes on a different meaning so sometimes it's about swapping pictures out again looking for potential triggers if the hallucinations delusions become particularly worse in a very short period of time it's again looking is there a different is there something else going on is that person overtired are they unwell have they been doing too much so sometimes we talk about keeping a diary because there'll be a balance between being active and being out and about because again that can help with delusions if, if people become uh, sat at home for too much focusing on a particular object then it could take on a different meaning but actually doing too much makes us tired and then our brains don't work as well when we're tired seek advice we talk about medication um, and Alison will talk in more depth in a minute about it. But actually we look at so there's different types of, of medication. So there's medications to help with the delusions, but there's also those medications that can call the side effects can actually increase the hallucinations. So it's on looking at how when did the hallucinations get worse when someone started um, a new medication. And again, it depends. So we look at the, the level of insight. Some people have very good insight and you can have a conversation about them and they'll know it's their mind playing tricks on them. And it and they could do it for other people. They're very fixed that that delusion is, is real to them. So it's more about managing their thoughts and feelings rather than getting them orientated back to reality. OK, um, and then quick look at delusions and Capgra. Um, so often with Capgra is that the person's there, but they don't recognize you as the person. They'll say that you're the bad person or something. So when we're doing about that, so we often talk about encouraging familiarity. So for some people, it might be kind of looking at going, have you done your hair differently? Am I wearing new clothes? Because they just may not recognize you as that particular person. 
So sometimes when we're processing information, it's it, for our brains to work better. We like to process information from numerous different senses. So often we'll say to somebody, rather than walking in a room and then speaking to them, start talking when you come in. So they get the visual of you, but also they're hearing your voice. And that just increases the likelihood of them recognizing you because they're processing both sound and vision. It, it, sometimes they say, if that doesn't work, you can go out the room. Some people change their clothes, put their favorite jumper back on that they know they'll recognize them. Some people have um, talked to other people. So if they say, well, if it's not me, do you want to phone that relative? And you go and speak to them on another uh, in another room and say, well, actually, I'm just coming in. I've just been out. I'm just coming in and then walk into the room. Sometimes the delusions can be quite fixed and they just last a period of time. And sometimes when they're like that, some people just manage them. So they'll keep an eye on the person with dementia and check that they're safe. But actually, they'll just keep popping in and out. And if they go, no, you're not the real one, they'll go away again. And eventually, after a period of time, and that it might be the fourth or fifth time that you pop back in, they'll go, oh, there you are, I've been looking for you. This strange person was here. So sometimes there isn't necessarily an intervention. It's just time that we need. That person just needs that time to process what's happening. And then they'll come back round, kind of thinking, yes, this is the real person. We often talk about not challenging or not disagreeing. It does come very automatically for you to go, no, no, I'm the real person. That's fine. These things will happen. But actually, if you've said that two or three times and they're still insistent that you're not, it doesn't matter whether you say it two or ten times. They, they, they're not going to come round. So sometimes it's about going, actually, I've said it twice. I'm just going to leave it now. Offer reassurance. So if that person's become distressed, it might be about just responding to that distress. So, yeah, I know you find it distressing that your relative or your husband or wife or somebody that they're particular after is not here at the moment. Sometimes it's about going, okay, I'll go and look for them coming back. And as I say, while you're out changing your jumper, doing, you know, applying all those, those things and then coming back in almost. Um, you know, and often we say to it's just about ensuring that person's safety as well. So obviously things, if they're trying to leave the house to look for that person, we may need to put things in place to try and manage that. And obviously, you know, if you're struggling, please um, seek professional advice and support. OK, um, we do. There is a couple of leaflets that are very helpful. So these are available on the Louis Body Society. Um, they're free to carers or you can download, print them off and give them to people or have a look at yourself. So all of those hints and tips that I talked about are in the leaflets. So please use these as a resource. OK, I'm now going to hand over to Alison, who's going to do her bit. Thanks, Rachel. So some really helpful um practical tips there from a sort of psychosocial point of view and I'm just very um, briefly really going to touch on the um, the medication management um, because although I realise that many of the people listening to this um, and watching this video are probably not actually prescribing these things certainly um, families do come to us and and want us to have a good understanding of what might um what, what they might be prescribed or the relatives might be prescribed. Um, so in terms of the hallucinations and delusions in Lewy body disease, it's really important, first of all, to think about what might be actually causing those hallucinations, um, whether that is condition related or whether, as Rachel touched on, it is a medication side effect or whether it's in fact due to delirium, because that's going to definitely affect the medications that are prescribed. So the first line medication is very highly likely to be um, an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. And of those, there are three that are very commonly prescribed, um, probably the most common one being denepazil. So people will not be prescribed all three of these, they'll be prescribed one, um, but it may be that if one doesn't suit them, then there an, a different one will be tried. So in terms of denepazil, this is generally taken at bedtime, um, partly because it can have some sort of nauseating side effects. And if people are not trying to eat overnight, then they don't necessarily experience those symptoms. Um, people have a starting dose and then assuming they tolerate it, the general um, continuation dose is 10 milligrams. Uh, very occasionally people are prescribed a higher dose. Rivastigmine can be a really good um, alternative 
because it also comes in the form of a patch. Um, and the patch is very beneficial for people because it means they get a constant surge of the a constant amount of the drug rather than the surges that you get when you're taking it orally. Um, and they don't get the the gastro side effects that they might otherwise get. So the patch is worn very similarly to any other patch in terms of um, like a hormone patch or a, a nicotine patch. And as long as the person is not concerned by it or trying to remove it, then patches are just rotated daily. And then um, as an alternative, as I say, you can, can, can put people onto galantamine and the doses are here. So like all medications, there are side effects, and I'm just going to focus on the ones for denepazil. Um, you can look up the other ones, but they are similar in many ways. Um, and this is important to look at because um, in terms of patients thinking whether, should, whether they should continue a drug or being alerted to side effects before they start it, um, while you don't necessarily want to dwell on the negative with people, it's important that they're aware. Um, the really most common side effect, which I've mentioned earlier, is this kind of nausea feeling. It's very rarely becomes um, a symptom of vomiting. Often it's just a little bit of nausea, which people can push through and tolerate the drug for a couple of weeks. And then it really very often just wears off. Um, these other symptoms can occur, but as I say, they are particularly um much less common um, and particularly if somebody's getting increased hallucinations on a new drug you might want to think is that medication related and you know the, although are common this can occur with denepazil. Um, also worth mentioning that if the person is still driving and obviously recognizing that a lot of um, people with Lewy body dementia may not be driving but people with um, more milder condition might be um, it can affect that as well. And then there are some rare cardiac effects. So you probably find that people have um, a pulse check before they're prescribed this drug. And if um, they have got bradycardia, then they may need to have something different. Um, and sometimes in clinics, people are given an ECG before they're started on this. Thank you. So either instead or in addition to um, the, the denepazil type of medication, sometimes people are put on to memantine. Now there's a very good evidence base for memantine in Alzheimer's, but currently the jury is out. There's only a very small study being done in, um, in Lewy body dementia, but there is actually a study in progress, the Cobalt study, looking at whether adding in memantine, so as a second line treatment, actually helps people. And these drugs, although they are given for dementia overall, are very helpful in helping people's concentration to improve. And sometimes improving concentration and thinking skills can be a really big step in improving hallucinations, giving people a bit more insight into whether they're real or not, or even just um, making them go away. So these drugs can be really beneficial um, for the sort of hallucinations and delusions stages. So you can see memantine is given in steps, gradually up to a maximum. If people don't tolerate that, they might, they might have a smaller dose, 10 or 15 as a maintenance dose. Um, melatonin can also be added in, um, very common drug used in some countries bought over the counter even um, for jet lag. This is um, a good drug for helping to regulate people's sleep. The starting dose is there, but people can have three, four times that amount if it's beneficial. Thank you. So another medication which is sometimes added in, particularly if, well, mainly if people are having delusions, um, comes from the antipsychotic um, field of medications of which there are several different types. The delusions in many ways can be more distressing both to people and to other family members than the actual hallucinations and they can be very fixed and difficult to to change or for people to have the insight into understanding that they're not real. 
So there's often um, a lot of red flags and warnings about giving antipsychotics in Lewy body disease. And that's really important in terms of the traditional antipsychotics, which should absolutely be avoided, um, partly because they can lead to worsening um, Parkinsonian features and people can become very immobile. Um, but also there is this rare but very life-threatening emergency um, situation where people can get this neuroleptic malignant syndrome and that's um, associated with traditional antipsychotics. So they should definitely be avoided. However, there is room for the use of some types of antipsychotics with caution. And these come from this atypical antipsychotic group. Now, there are some even in this group that should be avoided um, due to side effects, including olanzapine and risperidone. Um, however, drugs such as catiapine are safer in both PDD and DLB. For some reason, we don't really know why, um, patients with Parkinson's dementia do seem to have a lower chance of reacting to antipsychotics, but in DLB, it is, it is significant. So it's very important that these medications are started on a very low dose. Um, and this is a really tiny dose compared to what might be given in other psychiatric conditions, but typically 6.25 milligrams. Um, and there is room then to increase that. There is another drug um, instead of catiapine, which can be used, which is clozapine. And again, that is often very effective but it does have a really significant side effect, um, an effect on the white blood cells. And as a result, people do need to have a lot of blood tests and really close blood monitoring. So perhaps that's less of a drug of choice than, than catiapine, which is quite often used. And then if the hallucinations are due to a delirium, um, which might be the case if they come on very suddenly and there are other behavior changes, or if an infection or something has already been identified, then that's going to be a different, a different cause. And hopefully in that case, the hallucinations will be short-lived. And once the delirium has been treated, the hallucinations should subside. So delirium can come about due to infection, which we know people with Lewy body disease are very susceptible to, um, or also other factors such as constipation or dehydration. So it's always worth thinking about those and treating those, as I say, particularly if it's a sudden in onset. The other thing that's important is to bear in mind that some of the drugs that people are given for other reasons can um, have a depletion effect, um, an anticholinergic effect, and therefore, reviewing and if possible stopping them might also be very significant in reducing the um the hallucinations um <clears throat> so as i say as well as adding in extra drugs looking at whether these drugs are still necessary or whether they could actually be swapped for something else um so you can see examples there of medications to look at um and looking at alternatives like Oxybutynin can be replaced by mirabegrin in some places. In some cases, it's also worth looking at the levodopa type drugs if people are having those for movement problems. Um, and you may have heard people talk in clinics or about a balancing effect of trying to control movement symptoms while not making hallucinations worse. And it is difficult, and sometimes it's important to be guided by the person taking the medications and their families as to which of those problems they feel is most significant. If people have hallucinations which are not distressing, but their movement problems are severely limiting them getting out and about, you might want to focus on the levodopa and accept the hallucinations. So it's a difficult balance. Thank you. And I'm just going to finish with just briefly um, telling you about some current research into hallucinations. And often patients want to be involved in research, or at least they like the reassurance that there is research going on into this, um, this kind of difficult aspect of this condition. 
So there's research going on into the use of um, cannabidiol and how effective that might be. Um, the research into the use of ondans ondansteron, which is an antiemetic, so already an approved drug, um, as to how effective that might be for hallucinations. Studies often going on, including this one at UCL, trying to find out how the hallucinations actually arise. Um, and again, another one in, in Oxford looking at why people do develop hallucinations. So it's still an area that there's a lot of, um, a lot more to learn really, a lot more we need to understand. Thank you. Um, so if you are interested in finding out more about um, research, then please do look at some of these websites or definitely signpost the people you support to them. Um, they have a huge amount of, of um, information on them and really as you know that's the way to to find out more is to certainly improve the um the number of people entering research thank you thank you to all our speakers today our next meeting in 2024 meeting three um the date will be arranged so please do check on the lewy body society website for more details also on the Louis Body Society website, you can find the Community of Practice page on the Professionals tab. And there's the website address for you to um, go and check that out. And all that remains to be said is thank you for watching.